Hi everyone, uh, I'm Mike Willis, and uh, I wanted to tell you guys about some joint work with uh, Cyprian, Marco, and Sutri, where uh, we managed to generalize Rasmussen's S invariant and came up with some pretty cool applications. So uh, here, let's go with it. So um, here's the overall picture. This is sort of a review of what happens for links in the three sphere. Okay, so if somebody hands you a link in the three sphere, uh, there's sort of uh, this algorithm to build a chain complex, the Kvanov complex, it's a complex of bi-graded groups. And then you sort of have two options. You can take homology with respect to a graded differential um, and you get the Kvanov homology groups of the link. Um, or you can take uh, homology with respect to a filter differential uh, and you arrive at the Lie homology of the link. Okay, and I, I don't want to, uh, define these things, um, you know, I just want to just mention that all this, all these invariants, uh, if you're not very familiar with them, they're all sort of defined purely combinatorially uh, in terms of link diagram on the plane. So somebody hands you a link, you project it down to a plane, now you have some kind of diagram and just from there, there's like a combinatorial uh, setup from there to define all these things. Okay, so, um, it's a theorem of Lie that uh, if you use the filter differential and take the Lie homology of the link in the three sphere, uh, the homology uh, over Q, by the way, we'll be working over the rationals this entire talk. Um, over the rationals, the Lie homology is not that interesting. You have a, just a direct sum of copies of Q. You have one sum in for each orientation of the link. Okay. Um, but what is interesting, because you have this filter differential, um, if somebody hands you an oriented link in the three sphere, you can define uh, an invariant of the link S of L. This is an integer uh, that's based on the filtration level of whichever summands up here correspond to the given orientation as well as uh, the opposite orientation. Okay, and if you make this definition based on filtration levels of the relevant uh, copies of Q, uh, you arrive at this theorem uh, proved for knots by Rasmussen and uh, extended to links without too much trouble by Bailey Kova and Rarely. Uh, so basically, if you're handed a weakly connected link cobordism, uh, I'll explain that in a minute, but if you have a link cobordism uh, from one oriented link to another, um, then the Euler characteristic of your cobordism is bounded by the difference in the S invariance of the two links. Okay, uh, here is the picture of what this weakly connected hypothesis is. Um, your link cobordism, uh, as pictured here in S3 cross I, uh, needs to be, every component of it needs to be connected to the first link. Okay, this is really just a game of how you wanna make sure that orientations on one link uh, determine orientations on the other. Okay, but um, so this is saying that, you know, differences in this S invariant actually tell you something about uh, topology of possible surfaces going between your two links. Okay, and uh, it's supposed to be, you know, maybe somewhat surprising. Um, and a result of this, you know, a corollary of this is uh, you can use the S invariant to bound uh, the genus of a knot or link. So here's the situation. If you have um, your link, which is in red here, sort of portrayed as these two dots. If your link is the boundary of some surface where the surface is viewed as living in the four ball, which is bounded by S3, okay, then, you know, the uh, slice genus, or at least maybe the B4 genus of the link is the minimum amongst, you know, genus of all such surfaces, smooth, smooth surfaces. Okay, and then sort of a corollary of this uh, S invariant controlling uh, topology of surfaces tells us that the S invariant of your link L uh, gives a lower bound for the slice genus up to some terms. Okay, so the uh, absolute value of L here just means the number of components of the link. In particular, if it's a knot, these two terms cancel and the S invariant is just a straight up lower bound. Um, and you know, Rasmussen used this uh, to reprove the Milner conjecture about uh, the slice genus of torus knots 
And that was a very uh, important result in that, you know, previous proofs had sort of been very geometric using like uh, gauge theory in nature. And this was uh, sort of a purely combinatorial proof. All these things were defined purely combinatorially. Uh, but the proof of the corollary, I just want to like mention, um, you know, the S invariant on its own doesn't actually tell you anything unless you can compare it to the S invariant of some other link. Okay, and in this case, to get this bound, what you're really doing is comparing the S invariant of your link with the S invariant of the unknot, which is zero. Okay. Okay, and uh, one last little bit from uh, what was already known about the S invariant in the three sphere uh, is that, you know, the S invariant shares a lot of uh, properties with the tau invariant that comes from not Fleur homology. Uh, tau also gives you a lower bound for slice genus and some other things. But uh, these two invariants are known to be different. Okay, there are links for which they differ. Um, but then you see tau coming from not Fleur homology. You know, Fleur theory has a, a much more geometric definition than this sort of uh, Kamanov flavored theory. Um, and having this more geometric definition leads to, you know, leads it to be easier to give similar definitions uh, for invariance for knots and links in three manifolds other than the three sphere. Okay. Um, tau also then can give restrictions on topology of surfaces in four manifolds other than the four ball. Okay. So it's sort of a natural question how much of this can be done with Kavanov homology and the S invariant. Okay, so here's a question. Can we define all these things, the Kavanov complex, Kavanov homology, Lee homology, the S invariant? Can we come up with definitions for these things for links in other three manifolds besides just the three sphere? And similarly, uh, does the S invariant of a link uh, tell us anything about surfaces in four manifolds other than the four ball? Okay, that was kind of, you know, uh, one of the main motivations for what got us started. And so the answer is yes. Um, so here is a new overall picture. Um, instead of the three sphere, now I will consider the three manifold just to connect some of S1 cross S2s. Okay, I'll denote it MR throughout uh, this talk. And okay, so in this three manifold, it's the same, same basic picture. If you have a link, let me ignore this extra red for a moment. If you have a link, um, you can build a chain complex, bi-graded chain complex. Again, there's two differentials. The graded differential uh, produces something we would call Kavanov homology. Uh, there's a filter differential for which you can get Lie homology. Um, this, this red bit here, this is something new in S1 cross S2s. Uh, the theory only works if the link is what we call two divisible in homology in H1. Uh, that's really just to say that um, the link intersects all the handles of S1 cross S2 uh, an even number of times, geometrically an even number of times. Um, so let me not get into too much of why that's the case, but we need that uh, assumption to be able to build any of this. And whereas in the old scenario, everything was built combinatorially, here, everything is still built combinatorially, but it is more complicated. Uh, it's all defined using uh, stable limits of sequences of complexes coming from links in S3. Okay, so let me move to the next slide to try and explain what that's all about. Okay, um, here's the situation. Uh, so somebody hands you a link in MR, this connects some of S1 cross S2s. First of all, you think about, uh, this connect sum of S1 cross S2s as being arrived at from the three sphere via some uh, S0 surgery. And these are just the surgery spheres of my S0 surgery, or you can think of it as, you know, there's a handle uh, transporting you from this sphere to that sphere. Okay, so your link diagram can be drawn in a fashion like this, where the link can sort of pass through the handle by hitting this sphere and uh, appearing at the other side. And for each pair of spheres corresponding to an S0 surgery, uh, we draw a little blue dashed line, um, a path from one sphere to the other. That path doesn't have uh, any meaning in the S1 cross S2s, but we use it 
in the next step. So if you're handed a link like this, uh, what you do is you build this new link that I call L of K, where uh, the path that you drew with the dashed blue line gets replaced with, you know, strands sort of cabled along that line, connecting uh, the endpoints of the link that had been touching the surgery spheres. Um, so somehow the picture, I think, makes it clearer than any words I can say. You, you know, cable along your dashed line. Um, and then you do two things. Number one, you insert, so T here stands for a full twist. You insert um, K copies of a full twist along these strands, these two strands here. K copies of full twists on these strands, okay? Um, and so you have these parameters K1 and K2. So there's lots of links that you can build this way. Fine. Um, and also, you totally forget about the surgery spheres in S1 cross S2 at all. And you just pretend, well, you view this link as sitting in the three sphere. Okay. And so because this link is in the three sphere, you already know how to define the Kvanov complex and Kvanov homology for this link in the three sphere. And then the homology or the, the complex and the homology for the link in S1 cross S2 is some kind of limit of these complexes as the various amounts of twisting grow infinite. So somehow it's like saying you put infinite twists here and here in some, you know, well-defined limiting fashion. Okay. Uh, so the, de the details are pretty tricky and I don't want to say too much more about it. Somehow, you know, a lot of the hard work is done here. The central idea of this, by the way, is due to Rosansky. Um, okay, so that's just a rough sketch of how the whole thing is defined. And then once you have that all defined, uh, you get a lot of the exact same uh, statements that you got for links in the three sphere. So first of all, um, if you have a link in this bunch of S1 cross S2s, the Lie homology, again, it's not very interesting. It's a direct sum of a bunch of copies of Q where you get one sum and for each orientation of the link that makes it null homologous in the S1 cross S2s. Okay, so, you know, of course, every link is null homologous in S3, so we could view this as a reasonable generalization of the statement in S3. Um, but yeah, so this is the new statement. Um, and so if we want to define an S invariant, it's really only going to make sense if our oriented link is null homologous. So if you're handed such a link in uh, connect sum of S1 cross S2s, then you can define an S invariant using the filtration level of whatever sum ends up here correspond to your given orientation and its opposite orientation. Again, without saying too many of the details, um, you can do this to find this integer valued invariant of your null homologous link. And then you get the exact same theorem. Um, if you have a weakly connected cobordism, now it's in this manifold MR cross I um, from one really null homologous link to another. Uh, then again, the difference in the S invariance uh, bounds the Euler characteristic of your surface. Okay. So um, this time around, so you, again, you can use this to just, you know, uh, produce bounds on slice genus, but now slice genus can mean some different things. So uh, on the one hand, you could say my S1 cross S2s bound D2 cross S2s, sort of a, be a, like a boundary connect sum. Or you can say my S1 cross S2s bound S1 cross D3s. Okay, you have this option and the S invariant uh, produces bounds in both cases. And in fact, we have this nice little kind of square of inequalities. Um, if you have a null homologous link, again, you need this uh, null homologous condition. But given that, then the S invariant of your link, uh, as well as negative the S invariant of the reverse mirror of the link, provide bounds for the uh, slice genus, whether you're viewing it in D2 cross S2 or in S1 cross D3. 
Okay, and I just want to say quickly that there's a similar story for the tau invariant. Uh, this is pretty recent work of uh, Hedden and Rayux. Okay, so that's uh, one part of the story. Um, so here's just uh, the square of inequalities again. And so like, you know, in S3, the, the game was to compare your link to the unknot. In S1 cross S2s, comparing to the unknot is important, but you also, if you're really interested in this D2 cross S2 bound, um, you actually have to compare your S invariant to S of a very special link we call it FPP. F stands for fiber, like an S1 fiber of the surgery, and it's this link, okay? Um, P strands going one way, P strands going the other, uh, passing through the handle so that it is null homologous. And you need, you need the S invariant of this link to compare with the S invariant of your link, and we computed the S invariant of this link by reinterpreting um, the Kavanov homology as a Hochschild homology. Uh, this is also an idea of Rosansky's. Okay, but that's a computation. You work out that S invariant, and that's what allows you to do some things here. Um, what's interesting, well, one thing that's very interesting is this computation also tells you things about links back in the three sphere. So here's just a, a regular torus link in S3, okay, with two P strands, two P, you know, fractional twist. It's one full twist, okay? Uh, so I'll let T, 2P, 2P denote this full twist with the strands, P of them one way, P of, the, P of them the other way, okay? Um, so here's just a torus link in S3, a very special one. And, you know, I mean, it's the same. So let me, you know, the, the procedure I didn't say very much about, but, uh, I'm saying that you know the procedure that you use to define the invariance for this link involves just inserting full twists here, like cabling and insulting full twists or inserting full twists. And that's all this is. Okay, so in fact, due to the way that we make our definitions in terms of these limiting concepts, uh, we actually find out that the S invariant of this link, this torus link in S3, is the same as the S invariant we computed with Hochschild homology. So it's again 2p minus 1. Okay, and this result then allows us to say something new about connect sums of CP2 bar. Okay, so here's the, the game. Somebody hands you a bunch of CP2 bars, puncture it so that your boundary is the three sphere. Great, okay, so um, now look at surfaces in this, these CP2 bars. They have to be null homologous surfaces. Okay, because again, there's sort of this null homologous flavor to everything that we have to do. Okay, but the theorem is, in this situation now, the S invariant of your link, remember your link is in the three sphere now, the S invariant of your link in the three sphere uh, gives you a lower bound for you know, one minus um, the Euler characteristic of this surface. There's a similar game for tau. Um, it is different because tau can handle uh, homologically essential surfaces a little better. Um, but I don't want to say too much about it. Um, the issue is, you know, it was just another similarity that we found. Um, I do want to say that, you know, the proof here involves comparing the S invariant of your link with the S invariant of that special torus link rather than S of the unknot. Okay. And the reason you use this torus link instead of the unknot comes from understanding the handle decomposition of CP2 bar. Uh, the handle decomposition that has a single two handle. Okay, so maybe, uh, but that's uh, another result that we found. And as a corollary of this fact, uh, we we showed that the S invariant uh, cannot actually detect exotic luck twists of the four sphere. This was sort of one of the hopes uh, put forward in this paper by Freeman, Goff, Morrison, and Walker. Uh, maybe the S invariant could be used to disprove the Poincaré conjecture um, in four dimensions. And there was sort of this large class of examples, these Gluck twists of S4 um, that you were hoping to maybe find an exotic smooth structure on uh, and that the S invariant would sort of help you do this. But we find actually that this does not work. Um, and the proof is essentially that if you had a Gluck twist, then your Gluck twist uh, 
have to connect something with the CP2 bar, you're gonna get a CP2 bar, and then this adjunction inequality that we have uh, for S, you know, kind of stops it from doing anything different than it would have done for surfaces in the four ball. Uh, so that was maybe, you know, a bit of a disappointing result, but uh, we showed that, yeah, this specific set of examples, uh, the S invariant cannot help you distinguish them from the four ball. Okay, so I think uh, out of time. So thanks everybody. And hopefully we'll get a chance to sort of talk about this stuff uh, throughout the conference.